Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Today I'm reviewing a LOC programmer from ESU. The ESU LOC programmer is a device that allows a computer to communicate with ESU model train decoders. The LOC programmer works in conjunction with ESU's LOC programmer PC software, which you can download for free from the ESU website. The MSRP for this unit is $179.95. I paid $139.95 for mine at litchfieldstation.com. We'll start the LOC programmer at 100 possible points. The device comes in a heavy cardboard box with a clear plastic window on top. Inside, a two-piece plastic tray holds the components. The box contains the LOC programmer unit itself, a computer cable, and a power supply. A note inside the box states that a CD-ROM is no longer included. There is also no manual. Software and documentation can be downloaded from the ESU website. On the website, there's a quick start guide, as well as a complete reference manual. Another note inside the box has a URL for a YouTube video on how to set up the LOC programmer. This is a good box that should provide protection for storage and transport, though I suspect many modelers will recycle the box and store the unit elsewhere. ESU decoders are known for their outstanding running qualities, excellent lighting effects, and high quality sound. A number of manufacturers now include ESU decoders in their sound-equipped locomotives, including Atlas, Intermountain, Kato, Scale Trains, and Rapido. One of the things that sets ESU DCC sound decoders apart from some other popular brands is the ability to reprogram the decoder with different sound sets. ESU has a large variety of sound files available on its website for many North American and European prototype locomotives. Maybe you removed a decoder from an Alco diesel and installed it in an EMD diesel and want to change the sounds. Or maybe you want to change that EMD 645 turbo sound to a 645 non-turbo. Or maybe you got a recording of the whistle from your favorite steam locomotive and want to incorporate that into your model's existing sound file. The LOC programmer lets you do all those things and more. In addition to installing new sounds, the LOC programmer also gives you a way to program LOC sound decoders in a more intuitive way. You don't need to worry about LOC sound's myriad index CVs. You just check boxes on your computer screen. Incidentally, this is actually the second LOC programmer unit that I own. Other than some updated graphics, the new one on the right looks pretty much identical to the older one on the left that I've had for several years. I plan to mount one at my workbench and keep the other portable for use in the layout room or outdoors with my large-scale trains. The LOC programmer has a connector for the included power supply. There's a set of screw terminals for an alternate AC power supply, such as from a model train transformer. The manual says that can be used for large-scale locomotives. The manual also warns against using both power inputs at the same time. Only use one or the other. A serial connector can be used with a supplied cable to connect the LOC programmer to your PC. In the center of the case, there's a hole for a mounting screw if you want to mount your unit on your workbench or on the layout. On the back side are two indicator lights. One lights up green when the unit has power. The other flashes rapidly when the LOC programmer is communicating with a decoder. The middle has a pair of connectors for the programming track. There's also an alternate track connector with a screw terminal. The screw terminal connector is removable. Setting up the LOC programmer hardware is easy. Just attach the computer cable on the PC port to the LOC programmer. Plug in the power cord and connect it to the LOC programmer. After the unit is powered up, connect the USB connector on the other end to your computer. Connect the LOC programmer to a programming track. I prefer to use the screw terminal connector. I used a Kato Unitrack power connector so that I can use the Unitrack for programming. This is convenient if I want to switch between HO and N scale and also make setup quick since I don't have to deal with screws. I also have a cord set up like this with clips so I can use the LOC programmer on my large scale trains. You could also connect your LOC programmer to the programming track on your layout if you want a more permanent setup. If you have a newer Mac like I do, you'll probably also need one of these USB-C to USB adapter cables which can be had for $19 from Apple. The unit is lightweight and small enough to be stored in any convenient spot when not in use. I was having trouble getting my computer to talk to the new LOC programmer. After trying several other things, I swapped the serial to USB cable from my old LOC programmer and after that it worked fine. I'm not sure what's going on there. It might be a driver issue, but it's also possible that I got a defective cable, so I'm taking 5 points. The LOC programmer software is PC only. If you want to run it on a Mac, you'll need to install Windows and use either Boot Camp or a PC emulator to run it. I use Parallels Desktop, which cost me $49.99 per year for a subscription license that keeps the software updated.
By the way, even though it says Windows 7 here, I'm actually running Windows 10. That's a leftover from when I first installed Windows on my computer. With either a Mac or a PC, you may also need to install an FDTI driver so that the computer can see the local programmer as a USB device. I did this once when I first set up Windows on my Mac and I haven't had to touch it since. The Loke Programmer software can be downloaded from the ESU website. This is a complex program that's built to do a lot of things, including some stuff that I don't use or am not familiar with. I'm going to give you an overview of the features that I use most and gloss over some of the ones that I don't. One nice thing is that the latest software supports the newer 5 series decoders and is backwards compatible so that it will also work with Loke Sound 4 and Loke Sound Select decoders. The software is broken down into a series of what I like to think of as pages and subpages. The appearance of these pages can vary depending on the particular decoder. The engine I'm looking at right now is equipped with an older Loke Sound Select. On the decoder page, the top subpage is the address. This shows the DCC address of the locomotive, in this case 6327. This is also where you could set a consist address for advanced consisting and choose which functions are active in advanced consist mode. For example, if you have dynamic brakes on F4 and you enable that function in consist mode, then all of the locomotives in the advanced consist will go into dynamic braking at the same time when F4 is pressed. Note that this only applies to advanced consist, not other types of DCC consists. The analog settings subpage lets you set the characteristics of the locomotive if it is run on DC power. Brake settings has some options that are less commonly used for some types of braking. Compatibility has some special settings for LGB and Zemo command stations. DCC settings has some options for Railcom and whether the decoder should automatically detect 14, 28, or 128 speed steps. I usually leave all the stuff on those last three subpages alone. Driving characteristics is where you can set your forward and reverse momentum, forward and reverse trim, and how long the decoder will run if equipped with an ESU power pack capacitor. Function mapping is where you assign keys in your controller to specific functions, such as assigning F0 to operate the headlight. Settings can be directional or non-directional or dependent on a number of other conditions. One thing I really like is the ability to use NOT in front of the function key number. I like this for number boards, for example. I have mine to be set on unless F19 is pressed. That keeps them on most of the time, which is how I like it. Function outputs allows you to configure what each decoder output does. This is where you can tell a light to be a simple on-off light, a flashing light, or whatever else you like. One of the things I really like here is that you can name the function outputs. For example, on my model of SP6327, I used AUX1 for the ditch lights, so I named that function output ditch lights. Function settings gives you a couple options for the flash rate for blinking lights and the duration of grade crossing effects like flashing ditch lights. Identification lets you set user CVs where you can store any number you want. I don't really use this myself. Manual CV input lets you go to the CVs directly instead of checking boxes if you prefer. Motor settings is where you can set up your speed table and tweak the back EMF settings for the motor. Smoke unit has some settings for engines equipped with a compatible smoke unit. Sound settings is where you select the sound configuration number, which sets both the prime mover and horn sounds. There are also settings for steam chuff, random sounds, volume, and more. Sound slot settings is where you can tweak individual sounds in the decoder, as well as preview them. Special options is where you can set the decoder's protocol, such as DCC. Some low sound decoders support other protocols as well as DCC. This is also where you can check boxes to make the speed and function key settings persistent so that the locomotive will go back to doing what it was doing if the power is interrupted. One of my favorite things about the Loke Programmer software is the driver's cab. This allows you to test the locomotive right on your programming track. You can operate all the different function keys and use the throttle to run the engine. This is especially useful when testing new horn sounds or setting up lights. You can configure and test everything right from the computer. At the top of the screen is an icon with a green arrow. This reads values from the decoder in whatever engine you have on your programming track. When you have everything set up the way you want it, you can write to the decoder. There are two writing modes. The plain red arrow writes only the CVs. The red arrow with the music notes writes the CVs and the sound file. This can take quite some time, maybe 15 minutes or more, depending on your system. Sometimes when you write to the decoder, the local programmer will also automatically update the decoder's firmware if it's out of date. This is normal. One of the things I also really like is the ability to save your sound file and CV settings. I have a folder with files for all my Loke Sound equipped locomotives. I'll load the one for SP6327. 
The cool thing about this is that if the engine ever loses its programming for any reason, I can just put it back on the load programmer and restore it. Let's say you have a different speed matching setup at home versus when you run at a club layout. Or maybe you want to crank up the volume settings for a train show but keep them lower at home. You could save two versions of the file for a single locomotive, maybe with different speed settings or volume settings. When you want to take the engine out of the house, just plop it on the track and reprogram it. I've loaded a different sound file so that I can show you the sound page. This is the saved file for my Rapido CSX B36-7, which has a LocSound 5 decoder. This is where you can edit your sound project and customize the sounds if you want. This didn't show up with SP6327 because that engine has a LocSound Select in it and the sound files for those aren't user editable. All the individual sounds are WAV files, so if you wanted to substitute one of your own, you could replace the existing sound with a new one. A sound template pack with sound files is available for download from the ESU website. Let's see what we've got. I was unable to get the LOC programmer to work with the supplied cable, so I took five points in the hardware category. That leaves us with 95 out of 100 possible points, which would be an A on a report card. This is a good device and it deserves a green signal. A lot of locomotives are coming from the factory with ESU decoders pre-installed these days. Considering that this costs less than one of those, I think it's a really worthwhile investment.